Great. So, uh, well, welcome again to our Yvascula Summer School. And today is our last session, fifth session of the school. And today we are going to focus on topological states in artificial van der Waals materials. And topology is, of course, something that we've been encountering several times during the previous sessions. But the objective of today is to look at it in a more systematic way, and in particular, to understand what is the relationship between bulk states and topological acts excitations and what are the topological invariants that determine whether if a system has topological edge excitations and what is the nature that they have whether they are chiral helical pseudo helical and so forth so the plan for today is uh, very much like the other sessions so we will have first uh, 40 minutes of uh yeah of, of discussion about this topological stage then 15 minutes break and again we will have some short question for you to think about when while you go outside uh, then we will have 40 more minutes, 15 more minutes of break, and 40 more, more minutes. All right, so the plan for today is to go through the different types of topological states that we find in van der Waals materials and understand what is the nature of the topological invariant and of, of the uh, topological states in these materials, how they are protected, how can be destroyed, and of course, in which two-dimensional materials we can actually uh, create them and use them. So in particular, we are going to first uh, study the simplest topological state of matter, which is the quantum hull state in two-dimensional materials, which is a topological state that appears when you apply a very large magnetic field. Then afterwards, we are going to uh, discuss a little bit about churn insulators, and in particular, how we can get quantum, quantum hull effect in the absence of a magnetic field, in particular, in twisted graphene bilayers. Uh, later on, we will go to quantum spin hole insulators, in particular the phase that is realized in tungsten ditellurite, 1T prime tungsten ditellurite. Later on, to Van der Waals quantum valley hole insulators that we already encountered in the previous session. And at the very end, we are going to discuss how we can see quantum phase transitions and what is the consequence in terms of the bulk excitations and edge excitations. So in terms of the materials that we are going to discuss today, essentially here you can see the different family of uh, two-dimensional materials that realize topological states. So uh, maybe one of the most interesting ones is 1T prime tungsten ditellurite, that's a single monolayer of a van der Waals material, and a single monolayer by itself is a quantum spin hole insulator, in particular realizing helical states. Then if you think about churn insulators, then you have actually different types of churn insulator. You have, of course, the quantum hole states that are churn insulators that require an external magnetic field, and they can be found in graphene and only any other two-dimensional van der Waals material that has a very high mobility and there are very high magnetic field, in particular also transition metal dicalcogenides. Uh, and then there's a very special uh, churn insulator that requires zero magnetic field that appears in the absence of an applied magnetic field, and is the churn insulator that appears in twisted graphene bilayers. Uh, then we are going to discuss about valley churn insulators that are essentially topological states in which your chiral states are protected by valley symmetry, which is not an original symmetry of nature, but it's a symmetry that appears in graphene systems. And it, it stems from having two different DRK equations in your electronic spectra. And in particular, we will see how this is realized in bilayer graphene and also other graphene multilayers. And also, of course, one of the topological states that we encountered already in the second session was topological superconductors, which is a topological state in which your excitations are no longer electrons, but they are combinations of electrons and holes giving rise to major excitations. And that, uh, from the mathematical point of view, are actually very similar to churn insulators. So something interesting to note is that topological states of matter depend on what is the symmetry of your material. So depending on the symmetry that your material have, you can have some topological states or other topological states. So if you have either time reversal symmetry or conservation of the SC component, you can have quantum spin hole insulators. If you break time reversal symmetry, you can have churn insulators. And actually to have churn insulators, you must break time reversal symmetry in some way. It can be by an external magnetic field, it can be by an internal orbital magnetization, as it happens in twisted graphene bilayers. And for having valley churn insulators, you need to actually conserve a symmetry, which is this emergent symmetry that you find in graphene multilayer, which is the valley symmetry. And finally, in topological superconductors, of course, as superconductors, you need to break gauge symmetry to obtain these major excitations. All right, so let us start with uh, top topology in electronic systems, and in particular, 
how we can see this emergence of uh, bulk excitations and topological edge modes. So the basic idea of topology is that you no longer think only about the electronic spectra of your material. You no longer think just about how your band structure is, but you also take into account how the internal wave functions are. So topology is essentially determined by what are, what are the geometric properties of those wave functions. And essentially topology deals with the idea that you may have certain Hamiltonians whose ground state cannot be adiabatically transformed into another ground state. Or in other words, you may have Hamiltonians in which no matter which perturbation you make, if you start with an insulator, you cannot go to a topologically trivial insulator without going through a metallic phase. And the way in which we characterize this is by defining something that is called a topological invariant, a certain number or set of numbers that tells you whether if a material can be transformed onto another or not. So one of the simplest topological invariants is what is called the chair number that essentially is a quantity that you define from your wave functions alone. So you take a certain system that has a gap, then you, you solve the, your Hamiltonian, you get your block waves in reciprocal space, and from your block waves, you define a certain metric in reciprocal space, and this metric is essentially uh, stemming from your actual wave functions in reciprocal space. Or in other words, if you change your Hamiltonian, the metric that you get in reciprocal space changes. And once you have this metric, you essentially integrate this metric in the whole space, and this gives you a topological invariant. So a pictorial way of thinking about this is that wave functions in uh, gapped systems essentially determine how is the geometry of your reciprocal space. And when you are integrating the geometry of your reciprocal space, you are actually counting how many holes your reciprocal space has, whether your reciprocal space is associated to a space that has a single hole, or two holes, or three holes, or four holes. And essentially, the Chern number reflects how many holes your metric induces in reciprocal space. All right, good. So the pictorial way of thinking about this, of thinking about the Chern invariant, is the following. So let, let us just think about these two different electronic structures that we already encountered. So this was in particular for a topological superconductor, if you remember. The idea is that if you look at these two electronic structures, which are the electronic structures of our ribbon, you see that in both cases, there's a gap in the bulk. And now in one case, there's one state that propagates in one direction in one of the edges, and another state that propagates in the opposite direction in the other edge. Now, you can very well see that no matter which kind of, let's say, transformation you try to do in these bands, namely you, you are allowed to kind of, let's say, squeeze your bands or tilt your bands or contract them or expand them and so forth, you can never go from this situation to this other situation without closing the band gap. And of course, since these two states are located in opposite edges, you are not allowed to create here an anti-crossings between these two edges because essentially they can be arbitrarily far apart. So that is a physically unallowed perturbation. So if you try to do any kind of distortion here, you can never kind of get rid of these two states crossing the gap. So this is a pictorial way of seeing that if you have two systems with top different uh, topological invariants, which in this picture, is reflected as a different number of chiral edge states, you cannot distort or transform the band structure of one onto the other one. And in other words, the chair number, which is this number that we define through the wave functions in reciprocal space, essentially counts how many edge states you have in one of the edges. Namely that if you have two systems with the same number of edge states, then you can think that maybe you, you can transform them them into each other, you can actually transform them into each other because you don't have any any constraint in, in terms of states that are crossing the gaps. If you so if you have one state and you want to transform another uh, electronic state with one state, uh, in principle, there's no problem with that. You can start reshuffling your states without closing the bulk gap. But if you have a different number of edge states, then you are not capable of doing so. And that is the whole idea of topology. The idea of topology is simply to think about which band structures can be this, uh, deformed onto another bond structures and which ones cannot.
So in other words, every time that you have a, a topological state of matter, and in particular different topological states of matter, you essentially have H states at the at interfaces. So here you, you can think that, for example, on the right, you have a churn insulator. So the state that appears in a twisted graphene by layer. And then on the left, you have the vacuum. So the vacuum, you can think about it as the trivial state, is the state that has no edge states. So now every time that you have an interface between your topological state and your trivial state, namely your twisted graphene by layer and your vacuum, you are going to have one state that propagates in, in that direction. And essentially, the idea is that no matter how you are making this interface between those two, uh, those two systems, no matter if your edge is rough or no matter if you have, let's say, impurities on your edge or if you have any arbitrary shape for your interface, this carval edge state is always going to be there because you cannot remove it from your electronic structure. You have a constraint on the connectivity of your bands to have that edge state in your spectrum. So the basic idea is that every time that you have a topological state of matter, you can rationalize the edge states from this picture, from the picture that you have two systems with two topological invariants. And every time you have two topological invariants, you are going to have interface excitations between those two systems. So you, this applies to, of course, churn insulators in which the topological invariant is just the churn number. This applies to quantum spin hole insulators in which the topological invariant, the set to invariant, this applies to valley hole insulators where the topological invariant is the valley chair number and so forth. So every time that you have interfaces between different topological invariants, between systems that are topologically equivalent, you will have edge states at the interface. And for example, in the case of the chair number, the number of edge states that you have at the interface is actually just the difference between the chair numbers. So if you have chair number zero on the left and chair number one on the right, then you are going to have one edge state. If you have on the left zero, on the right two, then you have going to have two edge states. If you have zero and three, you are going to have three edge states. But if you now have chair number two and chair number three, then at the interface, you are going to have just one edge state. So always the difference between chair numbers. All right, so the basic idea is that in all these topological states, uh, you have always a protection of your H states, provided that you don't break the original symmetry that gives rise to, to this topological classification. So, for example, in the case of the quantum Hall effect, essentially uh, your H states are protected against anything that you can think about. They are protected against disorder, they are protected against any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, spin mixing like magnetic impurities, they are protected against any type of, uh, let's say, interface, or even if you put a completely different material, or if you just remove a chunk of your material, and so forth. So the protection of the uh, churn insulating H states is, let's say, total. That is the reason why in the quantum Hall effect, one has such perfect quantization of the conductance. Now, for other topological states of matter, the protection depends on whether you are breaking or not the symmetry that protects the original state. So in the case of quantum spin hole insulators, if your quantum spin hole insulator is protected by time reversal symmetry, then any perturbation that does not break time reversal symmetry will keep the edge state. And if you break time reversal symmetry, the edge state will disappear. For valley hole insulators, any perturbation that does not break valley symmetry is going to maintain your edge state. If you break valley symmetry, your edge state is going to disappear and so forth. All right, so these are essentially the different edge states that we are going to consider today. So we have chiral edge states of quantum anomalous Hall insulators, uh, and of course, also of the quantum Hall effect. We have also uh, the helical edge states of quantum spin Hall insulators. And we also have the pseudo helical or valley helical edge states of valley Hall insulators and all also Majorana chiral edge states of topological superconductors. And let me emphasize that, of course, for the discussion today, we are going to focus mainly on which two-dimensional materials we get them and let's say how they are interesting from the fundamental point of view. But let me emphasize that every single topological state that I'm showing you here has 
a huge potential for different technological applications. So in, for example, in the case of chiral edge states, you essentially have a state that cannot backscatter. What this actually means is that the resistance is exactly zero. So the resistance is like the resistance of a superconductor. You don't have any dual heating when you have conductance through chiral edge states. So of course you can think that this could be potentially extremely interesting for electronics because you would get rid of all your dual heating in devices. Then for helical edge states, the idea is that you can actually have uh, spin transport without losses, namely that you can transmit spin information without losing any information in, in your pathway. And this of course could be extremely important for applications in spintronics. And in the case of quantum valley hole insulators, you can think that the valley uh, helical states or pseudo helical states are just a valley counterpart of quantum spin hole insulators. So in quantum spin hole insulators, your quantum number is a spin. In valley hole insulators, your quantum number is valley. And in the very same way that we are thinking about doing logic with spin that leads to spintronics, one can think about doing logic with the valley degree of freedom in graphing multilayers that give rise to valleytronics. So all well, these valley helical edge states could also be extremely interesting for valleytronics, of course. And then Majoran excitations in topological superconductors could be also extremely interesting in terms of topological quantum computing due to the uh, non abelian statistics that Majoran excitations have intrinsically in topological superconductors. So if we were able to control these Majoran excitations and break them with respect to each other, then that would provide a starting point to build a topological quantum computer. All right, so now what is going to be important for us is every single one of those topological states is essentially related to a different topological invariant. So the Cher number is essentially the topological invariant that it's related to the chiral H states that we already encountered a few times. And the Cher number can have uh, values of zero, plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, essentially any integer that uh, yeah, that you have. And essentially, the Cher number reflects the number of edge states and the direction in which propagate, they propagate. So Cher number one means that you have one edge state, for example, propagating to the right, minus one, one edge state propagating to the left, and so forth. Then in the case of quantum spin hole insulators, we just have a one topological invariant that can take two values, zero or one. What this actually means is that Whereas in the case of, let's say, churn insulators, you need to classify all the gapped electronic structures in uh, gapped electronic structures that fall in the class zero, in the class one, in the class two, in the class three, in the class four, and there's no transformation between them. In the case of quantum spin hole insulators, you only have two classes. You have materials that belong to the class zero, and you have materials that belong to the class one. And the class zero essentially means that you have one pair of uh, zero pairs of helical edge states or an even number of pairs of helical edge states. And the class one means that you have one single pair of helical edge states. And the basic idea is that if you have an even number of helical edge states, you can actually destroy them with each other using uh, spin orbit coupling. But if you have a single pair, then you cannot remove them from your gap. Then in the case of quantum valley hole insulators, you essentially have a very uh, classification that is very much similar to the one that you have for churn insulator. So your uh, valley churn number can take values of zero plus minus one plus minus two plus minus three and, and so forth. But of course, for the experiments mainly, plus minus one and plus minus two are the most relevant ones. And then in the case of topological superconductors, your uh, invariant is also a churn number. So very much like in the case of churn insulators. And again, you can have zero plus minus one plus minus two and so forth. All right, great. So now let, let me quickly show you how the spectra looks like for, for a very specific type of uh, topological state of matter, which is for a churn insulating state. So this is the state that has a gap that breaks time reversal symmetry and whose topological invariant can be zero, can be plus minus one, plus minus two, and so forth. So here you see how the electronic structure looks like if your chemical potential lies exactly within the gap. And what I'm showing you on the top is how the local density of the states uh, looks like if you look just at the chemical potential. So the local density of states is essentially what you can measure using scanning tunneling spectroscopy at, uh, at zero bias, for example. And what you actually see here is that 
at zero bias. All these states are located in the bottom edge or in the top edge. What this essentially tells you is that all the ingap states are essentially edge states, and one of them propagates to the left, one of them propagates to the right. If you start now changing the chemical potential of your uh, 2D churn insulator or doping it, essentially what happens is that you, you start encountering the bulk bands. And once you start encountering the bulk bands, you still see a little bit of your edge state. So you see that you still cross this blue band that corresponds to the edge state. But now you start also having some weight on the bulk states. And that's why you no longer see such a strong localization on the edge. And of course, if you keep changing the chemical potential more and more and more, if you keep doping your material more and more and more, eventually you cross completely the bulk states and all your states are located everywhere in the system. So although this phenomenology is for the churn insulating state, this essentially holds for all the topological states that we are going to discuss today. So this holds quantum spin hole insulators, quantum volume hole insulators, and so forth. So we have an energy window in which we have edge states. And then once you are outside this energy window, which is the bulk band gap, you encounter again your bulk states. And of course, most of the interesting physics that can be found in top these topological states of matter appear when you are inside the band gap, because you are essentially probing these topological edge states. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a, a very good uh, question. So, of course, some metals also have surface states. Uh, I mean, there are two differences with respect to the surface states of metals. So the, the first one is that, of course, in the metal, you have surface states, but you also have bulk states at the chemical potential. So you not just have the surface states. Then the second property is that those states are usually not protected in a sense that if you were to create a very rough surface of the metal, you would probably lose these surface states. Yes, exactly. It depends on the facet that you that you take for your metal, which essentially means that the interface between your material and vacuum matters. Uh, and then, of course, that essentially tells you that those states, in principle, they are not topological. Let me say that some surface states of metals actually have a topology that is related with a nodal line topology, which is a topology that, that appears in systems that are metallic. Uh, but if you think in terms of these gapped uh, insulators, well, the surface states of metals do not fall within this class because of those two reasons. Yeah, yeah, that was a very nice question. Thanks. <laughs> Why metals is not protected? So, because your band structure is the one that it is, let's say. So, of course, states that are protected require that you have a non-trivial topology of in your electronic structure. If you have a trivial topology, of course, you can always have surface states, but those surface states are going to be topologically trivial in a sense that if you start adding the right perturbations or making just a rough surface, then you are going to remove them. So it is related with how your original spectrum in the bulk is. Yes, exactly. Every every material or every uh, Van der Waals heterostructure that has a non-zero Cher number or non-zero set to topological invariant is going to have edge states. So that, that is excellent idea. Yeah? Thanks for the comment. All right, great. So let, let us now move on to the simplest topological state, which is the quantum hall effect, which is the topological cell that appears when you take a two-dimensional material, in particular graphene, and you apply a very large magnetic field. So the basic idea is that in the quantum hall effect, one essentially thinks about this setup. You take a 2D material, you apply a very, very large out-of-plane magnetic field, something between, let's say, one Tesla or maybe even up to two, 10 Teslas. Now, you apply voltage in one direction of your material, and you measure the current in the perpendicular direction. And the phenomenology that one encounters when one goes to very low temperatures and high magnetic fields is that 
the conductivity that essentially is the uh, let's say proportionality that you find between the voltage in the y direction and the current in the x direction is essentially quantized in terms of integers and if you think about real units it is quantized in terms in terms of the quantum hole conductance so you get one whole quantum hole conductance two quantum hole conductance three quantum hole conductance and, and so forth but not something in the middle if you are at very large magnetic fields and very low temperatures so the basic idea is that actually if you try to write down how the quantum hole conductance looks like just by using perturbation theory so you can think about Kubo formula that, for example that is a typical way of computing just responses and conductivities in materials you actually see that the whole conductivity can be rewritten exactly as the Chern number so the formula that we encountered before for the Chern number is actually also the very very same formula that you obtain for the whole conductivity of a two-dimensional gapped system. So now if we think a little bit about how this looks like mathematically, the idea is the following. So the Chern number was the integral of this omega that we called the Berry curvature. And this omega, as we mentioned before, it is related to the geometry of the wave function with how the wave functions are in reciprocal space. And in particular, if you know your wave functions in the reciprocal space, you can define something that it's called the Berry connection that essentially tells you how much your wave function changes as you move a little bit in reciprocal space. So you essentially have the derivative of your wave function uh, yeah, with the bracket with the original wave function. And then this very connection essentially defines something in reciprocal space that it's very, very similar to the actual um, magnetic potential that we have in classical electrodynamics. So the magnetic potential in classical electrodynamics has the very same mathematical properties as this very connection and these properties are that in principle it is not a physical observable because it is gauge dependent namely that you can make a certain transformation in this potential so take your function transform it into a, di a completely different function and all your observables remain the same and of course the observables are always the magnetic flux the magnetic field and so forth uh, and then something that it is of course very important is that as a uh, let's say magnetic potential you can uh, compute its circulation in a closed path which for magnetic potentials we say that it's the iron on bomb phase that essentially creates interference and in this uh, reciprocal space picture it is called the berry phase so the iron on bomb phase that we have for real magnetic fields is essentially the berry phase in topological systems a berry phase that is determined by this magnet magnetic potent, pseudo magnetic potential defined by the geometry of the wave functions themselves and now if you want to think in terms of more gauge invariant quantities namely quantities that do not depend exactly on a mathematical transformation then if you take this magnetic potential and you compute the curl so just the cross derivative what you obtain is the very connection the, sorry the, the very curvature and this very curvature is completely analogous to the actual magnetic field that we have in for in classical electrodynamics so in other words if you now think that this is actually a magnetic field created by the wave function themselves you can start asking yourself uh how many magnetic mono monopoles do i have in reciprocal space and the number of magnetic monopoles that you have can be calculated just by integrating your magnetic field in a closed surface and of course in reality we do not have magnetic monopole so every time that you integrate in a closed surface a magnetic field you get exactly zero uh, but if you do it with this pseudo magnetic potential with this very curvature and you think that your closed surface is now the reciprocal space is now your belong zone that it is a closed surface then what you are actually counting is the number of monopoles that you have in your reciprocal space and this number of monopoles is the number of holes that I was telling you that you have in reciprocal space in topological insulators. So the physical interpretation of this topological invariant is that the wave functions define a magnetic field in reciprocal space. And the topological invariant is just the number of monopoles that you have in that magnetic field in reciprocal space. And of course, what is uh, especially interesting of this, let's say, mathematical construction and interpretation is that 
that number of monopoles in reciprocal space is exactly a physical observable, is exactly the whole conductivity, something that you measure directly by comparing a voltage to a current. So now the idea is that in the quantum hall state, essentially you have different bands in your system that are called Landau levels that we are going to describe later on. And the idea is that each band, each Landau level has chair number one. So for example, if you have your chemical potential up here, so filling two Landau levels, the total chair number of your system is going to be the sum of chair numbers of all your occupied states. And in particular here is one and two. So if you now think in terms of H states, what this actually means is that when you put the chemical potential up there, you are going to have two H states. If you put the chemical potential above the third Landau level, then you are going to have three H states. Then if you put the chemical potential above the fourth Landau level, you are going to have four H states and so forth. And that is why essentially the chair number is an integer because the more Landau levels you include, the more, the higher the chair number it is and the higher the number of uh, carval H states you get. So the, the basic idea to think about it is the following. So of course, if you think about the electronic structure of the quantum Hall state, I told you that you have these isolated bands, right? And that you are putting the chemical potential right in the middle. So if you put the chemical potential in the middle in between two bands, you essentially have an insulator, right? You, you have a gap in your electronic structure. And we usually think that every time that we ha have an insulator, an insulator does not conduct electricity. So if you try to put a voltage in an insulator, you don't see any current, right? Because you don't have a, any free electrons close, the chemical, close to the chemical potential that can carry the current. So of course, this is something a little bit counterintuitive in the quantum Hall state. So how is this band structure in the bulk compatible with having a current? But the actual trick here is that the, all the current in the quantum Hall state goes through the edge states. So of course, the bulk is insulating. The bulk has a gap, but the edge states are the ones that account for your quantum hole conductivity. So the basic idea is that every time that you have a quantum hole state, you have a, a picture like this one. So your bulk is insulating. So there's no state if you put the chemical potential within the gap of two lambda levels. But then at the edges of your sample, no matter how your edges are, you always have states that propagate in let's say this direction. So either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And the clockwise or anti-clockwise is essentially related to the sign of your chair number. Now the basic idea is that in the quantum hole measurements, and in particular when you measure the whole conductivity, what you do is you put a voltage between let's say this state and this other state. And when you put a voltage between this state and this other state, you have more states propagating to the right than more than states propagating to the left. And that automatically gives rise to a current. So if you, don't put, if you don't put a voltage, the states in this edge compensate the states in this other edge in terms of current, saying so that you have as many electrons moving to the right as electrons moving to the left. But once you put a voltage, you change the number of electrons that move to the right with respect to the number of electrons that move to the left, and you get your quantum hole conductivity. All right, so the basic idea is that this quantum hall state is essentially one of the types of churn insulator. And it is a churn insulator that requires a magnetic field, but it's a state that uh, has a quantized conductance due to these edge states. So again, let, let me emphasize that the typical picture that we have in quantum hall states is this one. We have, uh, let's say a flat band that it's the Landau level. That is the state that lives in the bulk. And now they have, we have always propagating edge states one in one edge, the other one in the other edge. And when we put the chemical potential somewhere, we essentially cut edge states in one edge propagating one direction and in the other edge propagating the other direction. So later on, we will see how the Landau levels of let's say 2D TMDCs and graphene look like. And essentially the only thing that you have to remember is that you will see these pictures over and over and over. All right, great. So this is for example, uh, the first example of the uh, quantum Hall effect in an actual 2D material. So we take a triangular lattice that represents our TMDC, we apply a magnetic field, and if you just take a ribbon, the spectra that you see is this one. So you see a flat band here, that it's the states that live in the bulk, then you see sp states propagating to one side, uh, states propagating to the left, on one of the edges, states propagating to the right, on the other edge. So essentially this realizes both 
your, the Landau levels and the edge states, and this gives rise to the quantized conductance. So essentially the idea is that uh, when you have several Landau levels, what you actually need to think is that each Landau level is going to have its own chair number. And if you want to compute the total chair number, you just have to sum over all the Landau levels. And since each Landau level has chair number one, essentially the total number, uh, the total chair number that we're going to have is as many Landau levels as you have filled. All right, great. So now let us move on to understand the Landau levels in a magnetic field. And in particular, how these flat bands appear when we apply a magnetic field to a two-dimensional material. So if we think just from the, let's say, cl uh, classical mechanics point of view, we know that to couple a certain system to a magnetic field, the only thing that we have to do is to make a canonical replacement, namely to replace the momentum by the canonical momentum. And what this actually means is just to replace in the Hamiltonian P by P plus A, where A is just the magnetic potential. And of course, the curl of the magnetic potential is the real magnetic field. So if you think about a continuum model, you just have to make the replacement and compute what are the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of your system. Uh, and something that is important to keep in mind is that, uh, of course, in the magnetic potential, one has a certain freedom in a sense of uh, which functional you take. And the only constraint that you have is that the curl of your potential needs to be the real magnetic field, but you can have several magnetic potentials that give rise to the same magnetic field. Uh, and what is going to be important for us is that we are going to always work in a gauge, which is this specific functional that actually allows us to keep one translational symmetry because we want to compute electronic structures, right? And if we take a generic value of the magnetic potential, we may break all the translational symmetry of the Hamiltonian, but if we take the right magnetic potential, we can keep the translational symmetry at, le at least in one direction, and we can define the electronic structure of a one-dimensional ribbon or a one-dimensional quantum hole bar. All right, great. And let me emphasize that uh, the gauge that we are going to use is the Landau gauge, which is this gauge that preserves translational symmetry in one direction. There are other gauges that are useful for other, uh, yeah, for other cases. So in particular, the symmetric gauge is useful to understand uh, fractional churn oscillators and fractional quantum Hall effect. All right, so that is in a continuum limit, but uh, many times or most of the time we have been actually working with tie bonding models, right? And in a tie bonding model, there's in principle no momenta. So we don't have P in the type bonding model. The only thing that we have in a type bonding model is hoppings. So now the question for us is how are we going to couple a magnetic field to a type bonding model? And the answer to that is that uh, if you just think about what is the canonical replacement that you can have to do in your wave functions, in particular in your localized orbitals to account for this minimal coupling to an electromagnetic field, Actually, what you obtain is that when you add a magnetic field, you just need to add a certain phase to your hoppings, a phase that essentially depends on your magnetic potential and on the in, uh, initial and final location of the orbital of your site. And let, let me emphasize that this is exactly the very same can, uh, canonical replacement that we have in the continuum limit. This is but this is just the final transformation that you get once you think about how that it affects the hoppings. So in short, if you have, if you want to compute a certain type of model, as we have been doing for different types of uh, materials, both for my magnetic materials, uh, let's say superconductors, uh, and of course now to topological insulators, the only thing that you have to do is to add, uh, let's say this specific phase. And, and if you now think about this special gauge in which we keep one of the translational symmetries, essentially the result that you get is that you need to add a phase that depends on the difference between your x locations and the sum of your y locations. So this by definition keeps the translational symmetry in the x direction and breaks the translational symmetry in the y direction. So this is the gauge that we are going to, to use all the time. And of course, this is the gauge that uh, you will be using during the uh, exercise session this afternoon. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let me briefly tell you something extremely, I would say even inspiring of the quantum Hall effect. 
So think about a, a square lattice. And the square, I'm taking a square lattice because it's the simplest one in which you can understand this. So in the square lattice, you can think that you have, let's say, a certain ribbon of the square lattice. And you want to couple this ribbon of a square lattice to a magnetic field. Then what you, the only thing that you have to do is to include these faces on, on your square lattice. Then since you still have foundational symmetry in the x direction, you can do a Fourier transform in the x direction. And of course, you are going to have a unit cell that has a certain number of sides you have in the width of your ribbon. And as I go from here to there, I'm just tilting the system so that it is easier to see. If you now think about how your block Hamiltonian is, once you transform, once you do the Fourier transform in the x direction, what you actually get is that the block Hamiltonian uh, essentially takes this form. So it's first neighbor hopping between your sides, which is the safe first neighbor hopping that had in the y direction. But now there's an on-site energy that changes as you go in the y direction. And it changes as cosine of Bn, where B is the magnetic field. And you may remember that this is the model that we discussed in the previous session for quasi-periodic physics. This is the model that in, we, in which if you take B to be 2 pi times a um, irrational number, essentially you never have periodicity. This is the model in which we observe mini bands. This is the model in which we start seeing, uh, let's say different bank of singularities as we ramp up the value. And this is a model that most importantly was a one dimensional model. <laughs> so the quantum Hall effect, which is a two dimensional electronic state of matter is actually mathematically equivalent to a one dimensional model that it's a quasi-periodic model. So this is one of the examples in which you can see that a one-dimensional quasi-periodic model or a one-dimensional Moiré potential is actually equivalent to a two-dimensional quantum Hall state. And let me emphasize that this is not a trick that you can just apply to the square lattice. You can apply it to any lattice, to triangular, honeycomb lattice. It doesn't matter how many hoppings that you have. And of course, you can also do it in higher dimensions. So you, if you have a two-dimensional model that has a quasi-periodic modulation, you can do this very same trick and see that it actually arises from a higher dimensional model in which you applied a magnetic field. So a two-dimensional quasi-periodic model is equivalent to a four-dimensional quasi-periodic model with magnetic field and so forth. So in other words, in the very same way that we expect something that looks like Landau levels in uh, a system in which we apply a magnetic field, we are also going to have something that looks like Landau levels when we have quasi-periodicity. We are also going to have something that looks like Landau levels when we have a Moiré pattern. And this is, of course, something that also applies to, to the material. So every time that you have a twisted to the material, you can very often think that the flat bands that you get are actually the pseudo-Landau levels of a higher dimensional quantum Hall state just because you have this transformation between quasi-periodicity and uh, a magnetic field. And there are actually spe uh, specific cases in which this mapping is exact. And in the case of twisted bilayer graphing, you can actually show that the flat bands that you get at the magic angle are essentially pseudo-Landau levels. You can either understand them from a higher dimensional quantum Hall state or pseudo-Landau levels for a non-Abelian gauge field. So they are, uh, let's say, analogous to dif two different types of Landau levels. Uh, the, the reason is because uh, the gauge transformation is similar. Like, uh, what, what's the reason? Like, why is that? Like, uh, like the gauge products. Because we didn't do any Landau gauge. Uh, yeah, so... He, so yeah, in the, in the Moiré, you didn't do any gauge transformation. So you can think in, in this way. So the, this is the Landau gauge, right? Uh, and essentially, the Landau gauge breaks the translational symmetry in one of the directions. Mm -hmm. And when you break translational symmetry in one of the directions, I mean, you, you can think that you have a quasi-periodic modulation. So of course, the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. So here, of course, the. Um, let's say the wave vector of your modulation is given by the magnetic field. In the Moiré, the wave vector of the modulation is given by the Moiré itself, right? So a certain Moiré pattern maps to a higher dimensional quantum Hall state with a fixed magnetic field, right? You 
so in the way in which you can change the magnetic field is by changing the rotation angle because the the modulation in real space essentially maps to this higher dimensional magnetic field so uh, what is important uh, for us and it will be important later on for understand churn insulators is that you can switch between magnetic fields and more patterns and they are equivalent so you can sometimes understand the electronic structures from the point of view of more patterns sometimes it is more interesting to think about them in terms of higher dimensional magnetic fields and of course if you take a quantum hole system and you start uh, seeing how the spectra looks like as a function of the magnetic field the, ver the picture that you obtain is the very same picture of the spectra as for a quasi-periodic system so let me uh, mention that usually the physical regime that one sees with magnetic field is the regime of very very small bits so in particular this regime over here very very tiny and these states here that disperse linearly with magnetic field are the Landau levels and getting to this regime is usually not possible with magnetic fields. If you have a super lattice, so if you have electronic states that already have a relatively large lattice constant, as it happens in more materials, you can actually see the full Hofstadter butterfly from magnetic fields. So for example, if you take a twisted Van der Waals material that realizes a lattice that has already uh, several nanometers of lattice constant, then once you apply magnetic field, you can actually see the full Hofstadter butterfly, just because your length scale is large enough for you to apply magnetic fields whose magnetic length is the same as the, the lattice constant that you have. So these Hofstadter butterflies have, have been observed in different twisted Van der Waals materials, in particular working on boron nitrides and also twisted graphene multilayers and, and so forth. But if you think about a single Van der Waals material, then your Landau levels are, are on there. All right, great. So from, uh, for later on, what is going to be important is that we have two ways of coupling to a magnetic field. The first one is just by doing this canonical momentum replacement in which we replace P by P plus, P plus A. And we can do this, of course, for conventional Schrodinger electrons that are the electrons that appear at the gamma point in transition metal like alkogenides, for example. And we can also do this for Dirac electrons, which are what they appear in graphene. And then we can also do it in the tie bonding uh, basis, and in particular, if you think that your atom-atom uh, distance is just the, the typical distance, so you don't think about the electronic structure of a Morris system, then in those cases, the typical phases that you have in your hoplings are on the order of 10 to the minus 4. All right, so now it's a very good time to do a break. So what I would ask you to think about is which one of these two options is the correct one. Uh, so I would like to ask you what happens if you put an interface between a chair insulator that has chair number one or chair number two. So do you get this picture on the left or do you get this picture on the right? 